like to welcome everyone to Salado United Methodist Church and especially thank Elaine for her wonderful prelude this morning. Uh, today we celebrate Senior Sunday. Our seniors are graduating, I would have to say, in a very unconventional way, but we want to congratulate them anyway. And at the end of uh, the service, uh, you will see their photos uh, paraded across your computer screen. So I would ask everyone to please stand so that we can sing together our first hymn, which is This Is My Father's World by Malty Babcock. now wherever you are this morning watching this online or um, later that you will join us in prayer this morning center us now O oh God in your presence in this place wherever we are here among your people as we lift up our hearts desires our souls deepest needs our hungers fears and failures as we have often failed to be obedient to your will in our lives, as individual disciples and as a church, we pray that you will forgive us and enliven us to be and do the gospel of Christ. Open us to your spirit's urgings and awaken us to live fully as your people in a changing, often hurting world. We pray this morning for those around us who need your care and ask that you would make us instruments of healing peace, and redemption. We pray especially this day for our seniors who are graduating, for those on the front lines of COVID, nurses, doctors, scientists, and others who are working to bring peace and healing to the world. We also lift up in the silence of our hearts those who we love and care for. Reveal your presence with them this morning and with us, God of life that as people of renewed faith and vitality, we may be empowered to serve your world and so give glory to you. We offer our prayers and our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you would please stand where you are and join us as we sing our praise song this morning, Only King Forever. guys that was that was great well today we uh, come to our lesson in chapter 17 of the book of Acts we're closing in on the end of uh, Easter we have another Sunday next week which is uh, Ascension Sunday festival of Ascension as a matter of fact and then we move to Pentecost which is a Long season of the church year, which will run all the way up to Advent. And uh, 
My guess is that uh, we have no idea where we will be on the first Sunday of Advent, which will either be the last Sunday in November, first Sunday of December. Who could have guessed that we would have been in the circumstance that we're in now, but uh, we seem to be bearing up well. And I want to thank uh, the church and its members for its great support during the last two months when we have not been meeting in person. You've been very faithful in your support of the church, and uh, we continue to do mission. Uh, Paul does his uh, youth work online. Kristen, of course, does hers online. And uh, I understand that even the choir is viral in some way or another. And that's viral in a good sense, of course. Have you ever gone to... Uh, meet somebody someplace and you get there a little bit early. Uh, this is the situation that uh, Paul found himself in when he was to meet Silas and Timothy in the city of Athens. One of the interesting aspects of the book of Acts and in fact in the whole New Testament is that Athens is the greatest intellectual center of the whole known world at that time, much like Salado High School would be the uh, intellectual center of uh, greater Salado and environs. And so there's Paul going to Athens. He gets there a few days early. And what is he going to do? Well, he does uh, what people do when they have time on their hands. He becomes something of an accidental tourist or uh, maybe you could uh, say a sightseer. And so he goes around the city of Athens looking at all the sights. Uh, now, what was good for, for Paul was that Athens was a beautiful city full of many things to see. But as the most important intellectual center in the world, it's interesting to me that Athens is only mentioned in one chapter of the whole New Testament, and it is this chapter, Acts 17. So Paul enjoyed Athens for a few days, uh, killing his hours by sightseeing. And uh, he had no doubt spent time in a lot worse places than Athens. And so he enjoyed himself in the queen city of, of ancient culture. Um, one of the things that happens when he is in Athens is that he notices that there are all of these pagan idols in the city. And the text tells us, Paul was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. What's interesting to me about that sentence is, what did Paul expect to see in the center of uh, elite pagan intellectual culture? Why was he distressed? Why was he surprised? That's like inviting someone to go to SeaWorld in San Antonio and noticing that, gee, this place is just full of fish. I mean, what do you expect to see there? But Paul is never discouraged by what he sees, and so he takes this circumstance to his advantage, and he is carried to the Agora or the marketplace, and he begins to evangelize. And what's interesting is that he is talking to people that have no clue, really, what he's talking about. The Agora, the marketplace in Athens, is a place where men went and debated the issues of the day, leaving the work to the slaves and the women. And so the men would go to the marketplace. And they had done this for centuries, ever since the time of Plato and Aristotle, and they would debate the great ideas of the time, and so there is Paul, and, uh, and finally, he, Paul seems to have been so effective in his public speaking to this group of people that uh, they decide to take him to the Areopagus, which is an area beyond the Agora, 
and uh, they bring him and ask him, may we know this new teaching that you are presenting. And so I want to read the text today uh, that is in Acts 17. I'm beginning at the 22nd verse. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and he said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through your city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we move and live and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given us the assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When the audience heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, there is so much packed into the action here at the Agora and at the Areopagus and in Paul's speech. But I do want to point out one thing that's, that's um, an interesting tidbit is that this is the only sermon that is preached in the whole New Testament that is preached to an exclusively pagan audience. Usually the speeches in the New Testament are preached to either Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians or Jewish people, but not pure pagans like these folks were. But as tantalizing as that idea is, I want to talk about Paul's conclusion of his sermon, which seemed to bring three different reactions from the audience. You remember when I read a moment ago, while God has overlooked the, uh, the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And I want you to notice that as soon as Paul mentions this business of raising of the dead, there is just sort of a division in the audience, in the so-called congregation there. And uh, you could say that there's a negative, a neutral, and a affirmative reaction uh, to Paul's words. Uh, some scoffed, some said, we'll hear you again about this. Others followed along. And so that's what I want to uh, talk about because those are typically the kinds of responses that people like us have to uh, the preaching of the gospel, whether you're 21st century Americans or first century Greeks in Athens. The first group responded 
in a jeering, mocking way. Paul mentions raising of the dead or resurrection, and people immediately turned him off. They thought, this guy is crazy. He has crazy ideas like Columbus, who thought he could sail all the way to China, Japan, and India. Uh, most people thought he couldn't do it. Or s somebody that has uh, developed a, a new um, vaccination against polio. It can't be done, they said at the very beginning. And so these people, you could say, are cynics. And Oscar Wilde said of cynics is that cynicism is knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing. And sadly, we all know people like this. You bring them an idea and immediately they reject it, mock it, and say that you are crazy to think that way. Now, the second group of people is an interesting group because they don't just out and out reject the message that Paul is giving them, but they do pump the brakes quite a bit. They said, we will hear you again about this. Uh, this is a famous and uh, effective technique that, uh, that is used by parents against their children. And believe me, I know all about it. What you do is your child asks you if they can do something, X, and you are sure to say, well, you're not quite old enough to do that, so uh, we're going to wait until you get a little bit older. And they ask about this certain thing again and again and again, and each time you say, you're just too young for that, but soon enough you'll be old enough. Then there will come a day when they ask about the same thing, and the parent will say, I'm sorry, but you're too old to do something like that. That's childish. And uh, it's called playing both ends against the middle. And uh, shrewd politicians know how to do this. Well, this group that said, we will hear you about this again, are really just telling Paul in a polite way that they really don't want to listen to any more of this at the time. But the third response, first there's mocking, then there's uh, stonewalling is basically what the second response was. The third one was conversion. And there were two people, Damaris and Dionysius the Areopagite, who both decided to follow Paul. Now Luke in the Gospel and Luke in the book of Acts is very often one of those uh, evangelists that pairs up a man and a woman. There's a certain sort of parody that goes along with the writing that Luke does. He talks about Mary and Joseph, Anna and Simeon, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Ananias and Sapphira. And there are probably 15 other examples, perhaps more, where Luke does this. What's important to know is that people like us have a decision to make. And when we are uh, confronted or encouraged to consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ as, as the final and decisive revelation about who God is, not only in God's self, but also for us, we have a decision to make. Decision to make. We can we can mock the idea of resurrection. We can say, we will listen to you about this again. Or we can do what Damaris and what Dionysius the Areopagite did. And we can become followers of Paul, who is a follower of Jesus. So to our graduating seniors, I want to say congratulations you will be making many, many decisions in your life, but perhaps none is as important as your relationship with God and Jesus Christ. And remember, this congregation is with you, praying for you, and loves you very much. As we move towards the conclusion 
of our worship this morning. I would invite you to stand and may we uh, sing together the praise song, Way Maker. That is who you are. That 
is who you are. That is who you are. And that is who you are. That is who you are. If you would please now join us in our affirmation of faith this morning. There is one God, and there is one mediator, Jesus Christ, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. May we receive the benediction. May God's spirit of holiness and wonder and awe be with you today, tomorrow, and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As we conclude worship and we um, end our time together, let's sing that chorus one more time, Waymaker. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing that again. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Oh, you are way make a miracle work. darkness my god that is who you are and you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are morning Hope you all had a good week. Um, scripture for today, this is part of it. Uh, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. That's um, Acts chapter 17, verse 24. So whenever we go to the doctor, um, they check our ears and our nose and our throat and our eyes. And they also check our heartbeat. And they use a stethoscope, right? They put the little things in their ears and they tell you to breathe in real deep and breathe out real deep, right? And they check your front and they check the back. Well, I want to tell you a little story. Um, we're going to talk about the heart. Um, and I want to tell you a little story about a man named David, okay? Uh, David was a shepherd and he was, uh, um, God was going to make him a uh, king. And he's the one that slayed uh, David and Goliath. He's the one that slayed Goliath with a uh, slingshot. But David loved God with like all of his heart, but he didn't always do what God wanted him to do. Um, kind of like us. Sometimes David had heart troubles also, but it wasn't like stethoscope heart troubles. It wasn't like a heart murmur um, or a reg regular heartbeat. Um, but David knew that he had heart troubles. And what I mean by that is David knew that he had sinned and he had done like wicked and evil things in God's sight. So what did David do about his heart problem? He went to the one that he knew that could fix it. Here's what David said. Oh God, I have sinned against you and I have done evil things in your sight. Create in me a 
clean heart and give me the right spirit. Uh, so sometimes you and I have heart problems too, right? Uh, we might have something in our hearts that shouldn't be there, like uh, bitterness or anger, or jealousy, selfishness or pride, uh, maybe greed. Greed's a very popular one, I know that. We want and want and want more and more and more. So when we come to church, or when we watch church, or when we're in church with others, um, everything might look great on the outside, but God might look on the inside of us and see that our heart is not right. When we know that we have a heart problem, we need to do what David did. We need to pray to God, and we need to say to Him, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do you have some things in your heart that maybe shouldn't be there? I do. I think everybody does. Sometime. So you just got to go to God and fix it. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father, we know that you can see what is in our heart. And we know that there are some things in there that shouldn't be. Create a clean heart in us, O oh God. Amen. Y'all have a great week. When my plans unravel and the doors are closed, if tomorrow finds me on a dead end road, there's a promise waiting, just like coming home, so I can dance into the great unknown, and I'll keep on moving, it's only just begun, I trust you. Like a brand new morning and I'm feeling fine Cause my eyes are lifted to heaven's eye Your plans are perfect, you can do no wrong So I'll cast all my cares until they're gone And I'll keep on moving, it's only just begun I trust you'll lead me, forever I will run because Nothing to lose, no matter what the future holds.